So we're going to look at functions of several variables. Now, we had functions that outputted vectors. So we called those vector valued functions. So these functions are going to input several variables. So they're going to work, look a little different. So we're going to first look at, I just talked about vector valued functions. So these are going to be real valued functions. And anytime we talk about real valued functions, that means the range of f will be real numbers. So we use subset notation. So this math sentence says the range of the function is a subset of the real numbers. So every output is some real number. Most likely you won't get equality here. So that's why we use the subset notation. So you'll get some of the real numbers. Generally, the range is an interval of real numbers, but that's not always the case. It's usually going to be some open or closed interval of the real numbers. So here we consider uh, the domain of a function. We're going to take several variables, so we'll take n variables, so it'll be a subset of Rn. So if we write out f, the input is going to be Rn, and the output will be R. So that's what we mean by uh, a real valued function whose input is several variables. So input is multidimensional, n-dimensional to be specific. Input is n-dimensional, output is one-dimensional, or just R1. <clears throat> so the input looks like we'll go x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. And it's going to output to some f of all these. And again, I don't want to use x, y, and z because that'll only work if we have two or three dimensions. You can use x, y, and z. But if you have four dimensions or more, you run out of letters. So that's why we're going to use subscripts here. There will be plenty of times when we know our dimension that are going to, we're going to use x and y. So this function will go, this example function will go from R2 into R, and it will take, here I know there's two dimensions, so we'll use X and Y. And it's going to output some function of X and Y. So let's take a trip back to when functions were one-dimensional inputs and one-dimensional outputs. So this will be the good old days right here. So when our function went from R to R, it took some x and sent it to f of x. When we graphed it, our graph was all points. If we read in set notation, it looked like all points, x coordinate, comma, y coordinate is f of x, such that x came from the domain of f. So that's one way to, is actually the definition of what is a graph of a real valued function with one dimensional input. And of course, when you graphed it, if we just take the parabola, it's super easy. If f of x is x squared, then all points look like x comma x squared. So we just graph, and we're graphing in two dimensions here, total. <clears throat> now when I graph this function, 
the x-axis took care of the domain, the y-axis took care of the range. So we're going to take this idea and bump it up to n-dimensional input. So let's talk about the graph of this function f. So graph of f is, now it's a little bit strange here because our domain is two-dimensional. So what we're going to do is basically add one dimension in, and it's the output dimension. So I'm going to do the analog. So the graph is going to be x comma y comma f of x, y. So there'll be two dimensions for the input, and the graph is going to include a third dimension, one more dimension for the output. Just like in when we were graphing one input, one dimensional input, one dimensional output, we picked up one dimension. So we graphed in R2. So this function is going to be graphed in R3. So we'll write x comma y comma f of x, y such that x, y is in the domain of f. So that set notation, what we're graphing, so let's look just at the domain. How many dimensions is the domain of this function f? So our domain is going to be two-dimensional. So what do, what do two-dimensional sets look like? Most of our domains are going to be somewhat boring. They'll usually be, uh, they're all what we call regions. A lot of them are going to be rectangles. Not all the time, but a lot of times they'll be rectangles. So domain of F is, we could just write subset of R2. I am going to need a third dimension. So I'm going to draw R2 as the xy plane, and then z plane is going to be drawn uh, going upwards. So what I'm going to do for this domain is just keep it easy, and I'll just draw a rectangle right here. So that represents a domain of function f. Now the output is a number, and what we're going to do for the output is create another axis, which will be the z-axis, and the height is going to be the output of this function f. So one way to visualize this graph is the height of the function represents the z-coordinate. So if you think of the surface above this rectangle. So I'm going to draw some type of surface. I don't want to draw a flat surface because that's boring. So I'll draw one that looks kind of like a mountaintop right here. So those will be the four corner points right there, and it will be some height over top of the domain right here. So a good way to think about the graph within this number of dimensions with the two-dimensional input and one-dimensional output, the graph looks like a surface or sheet. So let's do some examples where we're going to look at the domain and range. Now, I warned you, graphing in three dimensions is not very useful. So we're just going to look at the domain and range of some functions. So first function will be a function of two variables, f of x, y. 
So we'll have a square root y minus x squared. So originally there were two rules for domains. What do we have to look for with domains? One rule we're definitely going to be using here. All right, so all your square roots or even roots can't be negative, so you have to keep it real. So all even roots must be real. So what does that mean for our example? How do we make sure that this is not a complex number? I need to make sure this is positive, zero or more. So our function, I have to make sure this inequality is true right here. So our rate cannot be complex, so we're making sure that it's zero or more. So if we go square root of negatives, we have complex numbers, so I want to keep it real. All right, that's the first domain rule. What's the next domain rule? Don't divide by zero. So that was another domain rule. And there's a third rule that came in with logarithms. So logarithms have to have positive inputs. So that was another, uh, when we looked at logs. The only, uh, well I shouldn't say the only, most likely the only log we'll use is a natural log. So most likely you're only gonna be seeing ln just make sure your input is not zero and not negative. So we're sort of like a square root, but zero is also not okay. All right, so let's write down the, or find the domain of this function right here. The range you probably already know, but we'll deal with that second. So domain, we have this inequality, zero less than or equal to y minus x squared. You can definitely add x squared to both sides. <clears throat> You could multiply by negative one, but just remember anytime you multiply by negative or divide by negative, you switch your inequality sign around. All right, I could graph this if it was equal. That would be super easy. So this means either equal or less than or equal to. So let's graph the x squared equals y. What graph will x squared equals y have? parabola and it'll be happy so it's going to open upwards so the graph easy to make now for the inequality part of this the inequality says y is greater than x squared so what I drew on the graph is y equals x squared there's two places I could shade this I'll do one in green so I could either shade the inside of the parabola or not the inside of the parabola, also known as the outside. Which part do we shade? So we're going to shade the inside. If I look at the inequality, it says y is greater than x squared. So when y is the same as x squared, we're on the parabola, and y is greater, we're above. So that's how I like to think about these inequalities. So let's take out all that below stuff. If you uh, have trouble seeing if you're above or below or left or right, one easy way to do it, pick any point in this shaded area. What's the easiest point to pick that's not actually on the parabola but contained in the upper part? Zero, I would not mess around. I would go with zero, one. Pick the easiest point you can. Uh, if you want to test a point not inside the parabola, Zero, negative one will be a good point to test, not inside. Zero, one, or one, zero works just as well. It's also not inside the parabola. Uh, 
So you can test any of these three points to decide if they're in or out of that inequality on the board. So just reading that, if I look at 0, 1, so 0 for x, 1 for y, it's obviously true. But if I look at 1, 0, 1 squared is not less than 0. So clearly that point is not satisfying the inequality. All right, so that's why we're shading the inside part right there. So any questions on that region? Okay, so that's the domain drawn out right there. Here's the domain written out in inequality form. So however, however uh, you want to represent the domain is fine. So let's look at the range. Sometimes the range can be tricky. This function is very easy to write down the range. All right, can we get zero? Are there, is there an x, y combination to give us zero? If they're both one, I can get zero. If they're both zero, I get zero. Lots of different combinations. I can get more clever, like nine and three, or three and nine, I should say. There's lots of ways to get zero. Can I get positive values out of the square root? Pretty easily. Any number you're thinking of, let x equal zero and y be the square of that number. So any number you're thinking of positive, we can get out of here. What about negative values? Can we get any negative values? None at all. So our range will be zero to infinity for this function. So that's going to be our range here. All right, so find the domain and range of the function 1 over x times y. So the rule you need, don't divide by 0. So figure out what x and y values will give you 0, and which one, or specifically which ones won't give you 0. So you want to make sure you're not getting 0 in your numerator. And then also the range. What kind of numbers can you get out of this fraction? 
So when we go for the domain, you can either look for, oh, and I think I messed these up. If x times y is not zero, you're good. If x times y is zero, you're bad. So you can either describe the good x-y combinations or describe the bad ones and say not these. So it's up to you how you want to go about describing it. So what I'm going to do is look at the bad ones and then say it's all x-y's that are not these. So I'm going to look for the bad ones on purpose. What about the origin, good or bad? Origin's bad. What about the x-axis? Also bad. What about the y-axis? Bad. bad. So if x is 0 or y is 0, or they're both 0. So what I just drew is all the bad x-y values. So let's switch to red, and I'll just redraw. These are the bad xy values. So we're going to take everything that's not an axis. So how do I draw the good ones? There's basically four rectangle, infinite rectangles that are good. So I'll switch back to white and draw the good. So we need some dotted lines. So those are the four areas that good points live. So not on either axis. So I'm writing it as good xy values are all points not on either axis. So any questions on the domain? So if I write this in set notation, you can actually do it without very much thinking. x comma y such that xy not equals 0. So there is written out in set notation. <clears throat> And if you're not satisfied with that, you could write it as xy such that x not 0 and y, oops, x not 0 and, yeah, and y not 0. So that would be another way to write it. So that's the domain. Let's look at the range now. Can you get negative numbers out of a fraction? Yeah. Pretty easily have your numerator or denominator be negative in this fraction. The numerator stuck at 1, so it's not changing. So we can get negatives out and positives out. So any positive number you think of, just let x equal 1 and y be the reciprocal you're thinking about, and you can get that number. Except which number? Why can we not get zero out of this fraction? What about fractions would give you zero? And why is this fraction not capable? The numerator would have to be zero. The numerator's got to be zero in a fraction that equals zero. This fraction will never have that property. So this fraction will never ever equal zero. It can equal any number you think of that's not zero. Just let x equal 1 and y be the reciprocal of the number you're thinking about, or vice versa. So the limit of the term that you can do on that would be 0 or something? If it were infinity, it wouldn't be 0. Don't worry about limits right now. We'll look at them actually pretty soon. We'll get close to 0. You can get very close to 0. Just pick a really small x and y, and you'll have 1 over a tiny number. No, you want to do the opposite. Pick a huge x and y, and 1 over a huge product will be very small. <clears throat>
So you can get close to zero, but you'll never hit zero in your range. So other questions? So we'll write down the range now. A few ways to write it. It's all real numbers without zero. So you could write it as r take away zero. Or you can write an interval notation, negative infinity, zero, union, zero, infinity. So this will say all real numbers except zero or interval notation. So our last function, let's get crazy and go to three dimensional input. So we use w as the output variable. Let's answer the range question first. What outputs can this function have, or what outputs could this function not have? Everything but zero. Everything but zero. Now for the domain, we can look for good X, Y, Z combinations or bad ones. So I'll write down the good x squared plus y squared times z is not zero. That would be good. Or x squared plus y squared times z is equal to zero, which would be bad. When we graph the domain, we are in three dimensions. So we're going to need three dimensions to graph this. So take a minute and think about you need the zero product property. So we have a product equals zero. So that means one term is zero or the other term is zero. And what does it take for each of those terms to be zero? So I'm going to recommend you go with the bad values. Think about what bad values you get, and then it's everything that's not bad. So let's start with z equals zero. What part of the graph is, corresponds to z equals zero? The is it the z-axis? So all points with height zero. And remember, one equation lowers you one dimension. So we should have a two-dimensional object. That will be the x, y plane when the height is zero. So I'll just draw in the xy plane right here. So that's the z equals zero plane right there. Now if we want to geometrically describe this plane, I could write it in ax plus by plus cz equals d form, where we have zero x plus zero y plus one z equals zero. What is the normal vector on this plane? Zero, zero, one. You're just picking x, y, z coefficient. Zero, zero, one, so your normal vector points straight up. And all you do is find one point on the plane. The point we'll pick is zero, 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 right there. So geometrically, that's the plane you're looking at. <clears throat> 
Now, what about the other part? How do I know x squared plus y squared equals 0 is definitely not a plane without knowing what this actually looks like? How do I know it's not a plane? It's not a linear equation because what reason? Things are squared. So we got variables squared, so it's not going to be a plane. All right, x squared plus y squared equals 0. It's almost a circle. It's a circle with what radius? Zero. zero radius. What does a circle with zero radius look like? The Just the origin. So forget z. It's at when x and y are both zero. How? <clears throat> it doesn't matter what z is. If x and y are both zero, that's, that will satisfy this equation. So what kind of points have x and y coordinates zero but z doesn't matter. The z axis. The z -axis. So we're also throwing away the z axis. So I'm going to just draw over top of the z axis in red. So we're throwing out the xy plane and the z axis. So what's left is a little tricky to draw. It's basically two infinitely large donuts or a bagel cut in half that's infinitely large. Yeah, I could go for a bagel that's cut in half and toasted. All right, so what am I talking about? So we have our infinitely large space as a cube. We're cutting it in half horizontally and then drilling a hole out through the middle on both of those pieces. Now it's infinitely large but you could draw it. Oh, I don't really want to try to draw a three-dimensional shape, but I'll do it anyways. So there's the bottom. There's the top, and then we do need to drill a hole out of the middle. It is infinitely large, so it goes up and sideways forever. And there's two of these, one for the bottom half, one for the top half. But that's what it looks like. It is infinitely large, so it doesn't just stop right there. Just like the plane, the z equals zero plane doesn't stop where I drew it like it's stopping. It goes forever in those directions. All right, so that's the domain described right there. And if we draw it in, uh, write it in set notation, we can write it x, y, z, such that x squared plus y squared equals 0, or z equals 0. And if we apply a little logic, x squared plus y squared equals 0 means x, y, equals 0, 0, or z equals 0. So a few different ways you can write it. So now we're going to talk about sets in R2. And I'm going to zoom in quite a bit, so we'll lose all this on the board. The reason why I'm going to talk about sets of R2 is so I can draw them. Everything I'm going to tell you is going to also work in Rn. So we're only going to, we're going to draw things in two dimensions so that we can actually draw them on paper. But this will be true for n-dimensional uh, sets. You're going to see the word region come up quite a bit. It's just a set in R2. A lot of these sets will be some type of blob. Uh, you're going to frequently see them showing up as rectangles, triangles, something relatively easy like that. 
Uh, of course, circles, half circles are also very common. So we'll start, we're just going to go through a whole lot of uh, vocabulary on points, certain types of points and sets. So we're going to let S be a subset of Rn. So we write subset notation, S is a subset of Rn. And we'll begin with an interior point. All right, how many dimensions does the point S have? Oof. How many dimensions does the point X have? So S is a subset of Rn, so it'll live inside S, so it has to live inside Rn. So X really has N dimensions. So we'll write it like that. So X really has N dimensions. So it's an interior point if if there is a disk and I'll describe the notation in a minute but this d epsilon of x means the the center is x and the radius is epsilon so if there is a disk such that so st is such that So that X is in the disk, and the disk is a subset of S. So that's the end of the definition. So what is this disk? If we write it out in set builder notation, It's all points Y and Rn such that X minus Y magnitude is less than epsilon. And if I draw a picture of it, here's the point X. This measure will be epsilon. And it's everything inside, not on the circle, but it's everything inside the circle. So if we think about the point y, x minus y is the vector from y, let's see, end minus start. So we're going to measure the magnitude of this vector, and if it's less than epsilon, you're inside the disk. So that's just drawn out what we're talking about with the disk. Now, I called this a circle. What dimension are we assuming if this is called a circle? Two. So if it's third, third dimension, you call the disk a sphere. What do you call it in fourth dimension? Call it a disk. Or whatever, a four-dimensional sphere if you need to. Just call it a disk or a ball, whatever works better for you. So that's a disk in n-dimensional space. It's just the analog of a circle or sphere into n dimensions. All right, so that's what a disk is. Let's look a little more carefully at interior point. So let's draw some blob set like this. So I'm going to draw two different points in here. Now intuitively, one of these is an interior point, and the other one is not an interior point would be called a boundary point. 
Which point do you think is interior? Green. All right, let's talk about why. What makes the green point different from the blue point? So blue's on the boundary, and the green is not on the boundary. So let's look at the definition. Can you draw a disk centered at x such that the disk lives inside of s? The entire disk is inside s. So that's pretty easy to do. I'm just going to look at x. I'm going to draw a disk around it such that the disk is inside the set S. Can I draw a disk around X that's not, in, that's not entirely inside the set S? Yes. I sure can. I'll do it in red. Here you go. Just pick a radius that's too big. So let's look at the definition of interior a little more carefully. So it's an interior point if there is, so if there exists, one disk that's inside S. So I don't need two disks, I just need one disk. I could have drawn a disk with half the radius or a tenth of the radius. I could draw a very, very small disk. Let's look at the blue point now. Am I able to draw even a single disk around the blue point, we'll call it Y, that lives inside the set S. Any, point, any disk I draw around it, no matter what, is going to have points that are not inside the set S. So that's the difference between an interior and boundary point. So let's write the definition for a boundary point now. So this already used a different word. Instead of if there exists, it says if any disk d epsilon of x does not live inside of s. So the way you write does not live inside of, it's not a subset. So draw your subset symbol and cross it out. So that means not a subset. So that's what it means to be a boundary point. And again, if we look at the point Y in this set, any circle, any disk I draw around it is going to have points not inside the set. So that's what it means to be a boundary point. Ah, so that's a very good question. What in my definition prevents the point Z for being a boundary point with the definition that I wrote down here. It's kind of subtle. It's that first clause right there. So you've got to take your point from in the set. So an exterior point would, fit, would not be in the S. Uh, there is a looser definition. If you don't require X to be inside S, you get what's called a limit point. So you would get a point that's well, I don't want to go into something slightly different, but yeah, that's what prevents exterior points from being in there. So our next definition is a bounded set. So a set is bounded if any, take two points, if any two points in S if any points X, Y, and S uh, let me rewrite this a little bit. If there exists 
that there exists a big N such that any two points x minus y is less than n. So there's some big number n such that any points, the difference between the two, the magnitude of that is less than n. So what does this mean in English? There is some limit, some maximum distance such that every two points in your set are no more than that distance apart. You could think of this as the diameter of your set. Well, if you pick the minimal n, that would be the diameter of your set. So if I have some easy shape, let's say a circle with a radius 5, then I could pick 10 and say any two points you pick in this set are no more than 10 apart. So if you pick the furthest two, you would get 10. So the minimal such n would be the diameter. All right, so what kind of set would not be bounded? We looked at examples. I'll just scroll back to some of the domains we looked at. Ah, infinite donuts. So this donut gets infinitely tall right here. So you could pick any point close down here and then just pick bigger and bigger and bigger points, bigger and bigger z values. So uh, there is no point. Now, there is no point that has an infinitely large distance away, but you pick any n you want, even a million or billion, doesn't matter. I'll just pick a point that's further away. So any two points have a finite distance, but whatever number you pick for your diameter, I'll just pick a point further away, no matter how big you let that number get. So that is bounded. So we're going to look at the boundary operator. And the boundary operator is a new letter. It's actually a delta, but it's written in a weird way. Probably best described as an upside down row. So boundary operator looks like this. And if you operate on a set S, this is all, uh, all points, well it's all boundary points of S. There's an interior operator. It looks like a degree symbol or a zero power. So what is the interior? It's all interior points of S. can be decomposed into interior union boundary. So that mathematical sentence is S equals interior of S union boundary of S. So if we draw a picture of what this is, we'll take our set S to look like a peanut. So here's our set S equals the interior is S, but take off the boundary. So I'm going to try to draw a dotted boundary now. 
So we take off the battery, still keep the interior. Oh, perfect analogy. Take off the shell. There we go. All right. Union, the boundary, is just the shell. So there we go. That's all we're saying with this math sentence. More specifically, this says there are no, all points are either one of the two. There's no points that would satisfy neither of these two. And every point in the interior is not in the boundary. Every point in the boundary is not in the interior. So it's a, also it's called a partition. So it points either boundary or interior. So it's, Oh, time to go. All right, so we'll do some fun computations with boundaries and interiors soon.